So if you're just joining us, welcome to Building Engagement in a live synchronous session. And I think we can just go ahead and get started with kind of some of our goals today and then some introductions. So just a couple of goals that I have for us together is to talk about some of the limitations and strengths of synchronous sessions, um, pros and cons to everything. So I think we should talk a little bit about all of that. And we'll look at ideas for intentional lesson planning for a synchronous session, so things you can do for feedback, things you can do for activities and engagement. Um, and then I always have woven throughout the workshop as well as a special section at the end. Um, I have this special section devoted to strategies for using technology. Um, but again, that'll be kind of interwoven throughout the entire workshop. And of course, if you have questions along the way, uh, please don't hesitate to ask them. Okay, so um, go ahead and please introduce yourself. You may want to use the text chat for this, um, but we, we just want to know who you are, uh, what is it that you teach, maybe what is your online teaching experience? Um, some of us have taught online pre-pandemic, some of us started teaching online because of the pandemic, so um, where are you at in your own journey? And then what challenges or concerns do you maybe have about a synchronous online session? Uh, I can go first. My name is Abul, Abul Azad. I'm at uh, NIU, with, NIU with College of Engineering. <clears throat> uh, I came to NIU in 2001. Uh, I mainly teach in, uh, teach in electronics area. You, some of you may have heard of the name of IoT in Internet of Things. That is the area of expertise. And in terms of online teaching, of course, we all teach on 2002, all of the online classes. Uh, but my uh, my experience with online teaching is not that good because when I do not see the face of the student, it's something hard to me to get in touch for me feel have a feeling of what is happening in the class. So that is one of the biggest hurdles for me. And also the thing is sometimes I felt that students are not that engaged with online classes. The reason is that uh, and they might join from home and home may not have kind of proper environment to get fully can engaged with class and it's actually hard to say what's what is happening at the other end so that's for me thank you wow well thank you so much for for sharing um yes i i think this is a conversation i i never used to think about it before um but you know we we can tell our students that this is still a an actual class, even in the online modality, um, and it needs your full undivided attention, um, especially now since there's the new law that you cannot um, engage in these, what are they, the, the web conferencing sessions while driving. Um, so, you know, maybe that is something you can can discuss with your students and, and make sure that they know that, you know, they, they do have to be seated somewhere, right, to participate in a, a course. But excellent, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing. I can go next. Uh, my name is Reza and I'm from marketing department and I've been teaching uh, at NIU since 2019. And after COVID, we switched to the online format. And I think that the most challenge that I have in my class is to engage students in some sort of group activities because my online sessions are designed to do some sort of group activities. And I think there's always, it's really difficult to measure the student's engagement when the, you assign them um, um, a project and they have to deliver it in a team because uh, you know you never know who contributes the most or who is, who is just there to observe. Great, excellent, thank you. There are challenges, yes, okay. And I do see a couple of answers coming in here um, in the text chat too, so um, I'll just kind of read through those. Welcome, Patty. I see that you teach psychology and COVID introduced you to online teaching. So just wanna get better at developing strong synchronous classes and you've only done asynchronous. Okay, that's really interesting, great. And welcome, Brandon. I see your response in here as well. You're from special and early education. Um, 
and you mainly taught courses online for master students. Okay, so graduate students sometimes are a different population than undergrads. Great. Engagement is always an issue. Two hours in, students get sleepy. Okay, yes, they are, they are long sessions though. All right, so let's see what we can do for this today. Uh, I, I want to add one thing, if you don't yes. mind. That I, I found that sometimes I was uh, teaching one class in fall 2000-2020 that around 180 students in the class, is some sort of undergraduate class. And at the end of the class, I always see 10 people, there are 10, 12 people always in there, they're not going away. That, that, that means they put the thing on, they might be gone somewhere. So that is, that is kind of another thing which, which I have seen. Okay, attendance, really also another. Yes, yes, I, I agree, I, I hear you. Well, I have my work cut out for me, but maybe I can give you some strategies today, so. I thought maybe we should just start this with the online classroom dynamics. And I think one of the things that we know to be true about online education is that most educators um, come to teaching with the idea that they're going to be teaching in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom. Um, and so it makes sense that as you start to transition into this online modality, you may like the uh, the synchronous sessions, right? Because they most closely emulate that face-to-face -face experience. And, and that's traditionally how um, instructors have taught, right? And so I, I threw some of the main ideas up here onto the, the screen for you. Um, you know, you've got conversations. People can, can talk back and forth. You can make eye contact if you use cameras. Cameras are optional. Um, some instructors have, strict rules that cameras must be turned on during their classes, some do not, um, pros and cons to both situations. But um, even if you didn't use your cameras, right, there's this little um, option at the bottom of your screen where you could raise your hand. And that's true in any of the web conferencing tools. And of course you can do group work, right, because you have those breakout rooms. So in a lot of ways, Right? These synchronous sessions are, are trying to kind of emulate that face-to-face -face experience, but I do believe wholeheartedly that there are some key distinct differences. I will, you can try to make cameras mandatory for your online course. Um, it doesn't mean that it will necessarily work. Um, you may have some equity concerns with that, or you may even have students with technical difficulties, uh, but you can tell them that you want their cameras on. So from uh, from NIU, uh, is there any kind of rules or practices what we should do or we should not do for this for this issue in terms of camera issue? Well, let's. I'm going to answer that, but um, let me before I answer that, um, let me pose a question for you. So I, I think you should have access on your screen at the top. You should have a little um, text box. It, it looks like a square with a T in it. If you click on that, um, you'll be able to type on the screen. Okay. So this is just an opportunity for you. Um, what makes these online synchronous sessions different from face-to-face -face classrooms? It could be good, it could be bad, um, it could just be something strange that you've noticed. And you can drag and drop your text boxes around too if you find that you're, you're typing on top of each other.
Okay, I see some different options coming in here. It can be harder to read facial expressions in an online course, even if they have their cameras turned on. I, I would agree with that statement. Um, you know, maybe they, they could be frowning at the mess that's on their, their table or their desk in front of them. Um, that can look really strange when, when there's a, a webcam trained on them. People might be less likely to chime in. Students can engage in class from their couches. That's right, they could be in their PJs. Uh, if you don't turn cameras on, then there's no nonverbal feedback. Pets are included. Yes, yes. True story. As a online student, one of my birds escaped from his cage in the middle of class, and there I was with my Zoom camera on, and I had a bird standing on top of my head. So yes, these things do happen. Okay, so the reason that I asked this is because we like the familiar, right? We like synchronous sessions because they remind us of the face-to-face -face classroom, but if we treat them exactly the same as the face-to-face -face classroom, I think we can encounter some challenges um, as you've noticed here. So uh, going back to your question, Bulan, whether or not we should have cameras on or off, um, I would encourage you to think about a policy that makes sense to you. I would convey it in your syllabus um, as well as to talk about it during one of your first synchronous course sessions with your students um, and be open to maybe revising it. Some, some faculty always had this rule about cameras turned on and they decided to try it with cameras turned off or cameras optional um, and they had mixed results. So I, I would encourage you to think about it that way. Um, there are some equity concerns maybe attributed with webcams. So for instance, uh, some, some people do not have access to private areas of their home. So their children could be in the background. Um, so th this can be you know, difficult to navigate. I wish I had a, a one size fits all answer for you and I do not. Um, so I guess my advice to you on this would be, I wouldn't take points off um, if they couldn't turn on their camera. I, I wouldn't want there to be a negative repercussion for it, but you could really um, promote on the first day of class that you would like to have cameras on if you so choose. So these were some of the key differences that I came up with as well. So I just kind of wanted to see where you fell in with uh, this, uh, right? The students are at home, we've got pets, we have kids, we have families. Some of them have no privacies. Uh, there are equity concerns. I remembered reading an article during the pandemic where students were sent home. And uh, one student said, well, when I was on campus, I, I was equal to my peers. But when I went home, I was living with my family um, in their food truck. So uh, turning on cameras for that particular student was very, very difficult. Uh, there can be technology interruptions, right? You could have internet outages, computer problems. People are using all different types of devices. Some of them are compact, uh, you know, like they might be on their, their cell phone. You could have buffering issues um, depending on, you know, the speed of their internet. I also noticed that there's really just kind of this loss of an organic flow to conversation. If, if I'm in a class with my peers, and my pen runs out of ink, I could just, you know, lean across the aisle and ask somebody, you know, can I borrow a pen or pencil? So some of those things are kind of removed in online modality. And the last one that I put up there, I think is true for both you and your students. And, and we call it Zoom fatigue, but I think that fatigue applies to all web conferencing tools. It's very draining to be in an online session for long periods of time. So. That's just something that we have to keep in the back of our minds. But as promised, there are pros and cons to everything. So some of the benefits of the synchronous session, though, um, this is an opportunity for you to help create connections, to facilitate that collaboration. You're, you're humanizing your course, right? Your students can see you. They could hear your voice. Uh, they can get to know their peers. Um, and there's an opportunity here for, uh, you'll notice those three bottom bullet points on the left, building experiences, problem solving, and brainstorming. Um, those are all things that can take place in an online synchronous session. Uh, maybe that would be missing 
if it was totally asynchronous. So again, we do have those areas of concern, which I, I think we've talked about. Um, online courses in general have higher DFW rates. And um, this can be because maybe we need to have more conversations about how to effectively teach in a different environment. Um, it can be really hard on the instructors too, right? Like we, we keep talking about the students, but the instructors, um, they can feel like they're, they're speaking into the abyss, <laughs> right? So uh, we, we need to talk about the instructor experience too. So, all right. So now let's actually get to the kind of the, the meat of the workshop here, how we can plan for activities, engagement, and feedback with your lesson planning. As you begin lesson planning for teaching online, I do have uh, ser a series of questions here that I'd like you to ask yourself. So the very first one is, what will my students be able to do by the end of this lesson? And the reason I, I really like this question is, it's a little bit different than saying, what do my students need to learn? Um, of course, our students need to learn something, but this is very much an action-oriented question. What will my students be able to do? Um, and if you start with this question, um, you realize that this puts the ownership on the students. This is their course. What are they going to do? Um, we do not want our students to become passive. So this is always a, a good starting point. Another thing that you can ask yourself is, well, what activities can they do asynchronously? So for instance, um, if you have a lot of lecture material, is this something that you could record and have them watch ahead of time before coming to class? I'm not saying to remove all of your lectures. I'm not saying to devote, that you can't devote a portion of your, your synchronous course session to that, um, but to, to use your time wisely. You're in a group together, and so you want to maximize the opportunity to interact with one another. So what activities can they do asynchronously? And if you want to make sure that they do those things before coming to class, um, I like to get into the habit of just telling students, OK, every time I ask you to read something before coming to class, uh, maybe we're going to have a quiz you know, at the beginning of the, the synchronous session or some type of activity where they have to demonstrate their knowledge of, of what they read or what they watched in a recorded lecture. Um, if there's no follow-up, it's been my experience that students tend to think of those uh, types of items as optional. So how can you minimize lecture time in that passenger syndrome, right? So we want students to feel like they're coming to class and they're going to get something out of it um, and they're going to become active learners. So as you start planning your, your synchronous session together, this is another question to ask yourself. How much of my time am I going to be lecturing? Um, and, and see if you can maybe break that up into pieces or if you can turn some of that lecture into an asynchronous activity. And then the final piece to this is, what are my interaction requirements? And it's really good to be explicit about this. I like to write it out in a list, and then I present it to my students. So Abul, you had asked earlier, well, is there a policy about having cameras on or cameras off? Um, it is left up to the individual instructor, um, but I like to be upfront with my students about that. So uh, for instance, I had one semester where I said, I'm going to try it without cameras, or I'm going to say cameras optional. And most people turned off their cameras, at which point um, I did have to tell them what my other interaction requirements were. So um, how much were they going to have to talk during class? Could they type their responses in the chat bar? Um, and I let them know that I would be calling on them. And, and so I had a very, very specific requirements for my student, and it was just all about transparency. All right, so now for the different types of activities that we can get into in these synchronous sessions. And I have some specific uh, examples to show you along with this. So again, whether you're using Zoom, Teams, or Collaborate, you could do any of these options um, in any of those web conferencing tools. So you can start with using the breakout groups and make sure you're going to start thinking about random group selection. So um, this is where you divide your students into breakout groups and you don't assign them. It's just luck of the draw. You could do self-enroll groups based on topics of interest. I feel like this is an underutilized feature, 
So instead of you breaking up students, um, you can let them pick the group they're most interested in um, based on their, their unique preferences. When you have your students together in these group activities, this is where we can start to get into some of the things um, that they can do together, right? Because we're, we're going to maximize the synchronous session. So you could ask them to create a concept map. You can work on worksheets together and you can develop competitions. And I, I did promise I, I've got some specific examples on what some of these can even look like. So this one is kind of called the four corners or more debate. And so this would utilize that self enroll option. So for instance, you could use this uh, type of scenario for your coursework. You could even use it as just an exercise, right? An, an icebreaker to get students talking at the beginning of your class. So you'll come in and you'll post a question up on the on the screen, just like what I have here. And you're gonna say, should public schools, um, or just make a statement, I guess, public schools should never ban books. And so I have some examples here. To Kill a Mockingbird, Where the Sidewalk Ends, The Hunger Games, uh, these are commonly banned books. And when students go into the breakout rooms, you would number these. So one is strongly agree, mostly agree with exceptions is two, somewhat disagree is three, and strongly disagree is four. Right? So this is an option where students can get together with their peers and they can discover who has um, similar opinions, but they can also talk amongst themselves and maybe they arrived at the same conclusion for different reasons. Um, so again, this is just a, a really good activity to get them talking. So another one that I, I do absolutely love is peer editing and feedback. And as somebody who has a background in English, I've discovered that sometimes this is um, met with different opinions on peer editing. Some people say that it's a, a way for things to, to get off topic. Sometimes misinformation is generated, um, but other instructors are very open to peer editing and feedback. And I think an important part of these synchronous sessions is for students to be exposed to other voices beyond the instructor. So I'd encourage you to think about this um, to maximize the time that you have together and to make sure that your students are on track. Um, you can put them into breakout groups um, and before you put them into the group, you would give them a rubric with a very specific set of questions. Um, so for instance, I, I know I said my background was in English, but I might ask my students to identify what they thought was the strongest sentence in their, in their first three pages of their paper. Uh, students get a lot of value out of that. Right, then, then they hear something about, oh, wow, I did something really well. Um, I should do that more often, right? Then I, you could ask them things about what is the thesis statement? Did they have a thesis statement? So they are gonna have to answer these questions as they're giving peer feedback. Right? So you can make these time sessions and as an instructor, you can jump from one breakout group to the next. So the other one here is to solve a problem, right? We, we really wanna get into this idea that students can use their critical thinking skills to solve a problem. So sometimes you can do this right away as soon as you start the class. Um, you could ask students to see if they can solve a problem before you even give them all of the information, see how close they get and then um, regroup, right? Instead of always following this prescribed path of, first I'm going to give you lecture material, um, and then I'm going to ask you to solve a problem based on what you just learned. Sometimes it can be really interesting to see how close students get um, even before you give them all of the information at once. So to do this, what I recommend doing is just making um, copies of the same document. So um, once you have say like a worksheet put together, um, save it and call it group one and then save it again and call that one group two and save it again and call it group three. And so then when you ask your students to go into their breakout groups, um, you can just tell them to open up the document that corresponds with their group number. 
So it, it's an effective uh, practice, but instead of just always using breakout groups for students to talk and converse, um, now when you put them into breakout groups, you can ask them to actually uh, work on documents collaboratively. As an option here too, I did put the race to completion. Um, so you can ask them to work on solving something together as a group and racing back to the main uh, room once they think they've solved it. So you can you can always uh, give them a little bit of incentive to see if they, they can be the first ones to complete the, the project. So again, these are just some of the examples of worksheets that you could do. They could be essays, fill in the blank, equations, graphs, PowerPoints, flow charts. So it, it's really up to you uh, what kind of document you wanna use. It could be a Word document, it could be Excel. Uh, you could ask them to create um, mind maps. You can even do that um, if you're into Zoom. They have their own whiteboard tools when students are in their own breakout groups. Um, so you could ask them to create and save their own whiteboards. So there's really a lot of creativity that can go into this. And it takes some of the pressure off of you as the teacher to, to feel like you have to lecture and, and um, try, to, try to engage them. And another option here that we have are escape rooms. So I've actually found a lot of really great resources on this. I used to think this was something that would uh, be very difficult to manage and create, uh, but there are so many tutorials on YouTube about this. Um, you can create them with Google Forms. Um, and it creates customized learning paths. So uh, this is actually a screenshot of a a murderous plant um, escape room that I, I created for a for a horticulture course. Um, but the idea here is that students would go into this escape room, they would answer a question, and based on their response, it would determine what question appeared next. So if they got it correct, uh, then they might progress to something that's a little bit more difficult. However, if they got the question wrong, then they might continue to see questions of a similar nature appear to help them learn that content. And the advantage of using these Google Forms is that it auto grades um, so students can see their score at the at the end of the escape room. So again, it's a great use of a synchronous session. Um, you can give the link to students, um, then you just put it in the chat and you would put your students into breakout groups and they could complete it together as a group activity. Another idea here are field submissions. So um, I think somebody had mentioned earlier, I'm not really sure what my students are doing. So um, again, it, I like to put students in this position where they are the ones who are generating original content. Then I can see what you're, what you're doing. Um, so you could ask your students to go and do this. Um, and you could even do this as maybe something where you're gonna ask them to, to go on a hunt mid-class and it could be a timed adventure or this could be something that you ask them to go do um, asynchronously before class and then they're going to share it um, during your synchronous course together. Um, so one of the things that we do know about our students is that even though students have many different types of technology at their fingertips and some have an abundance of technology and others have very little almost everybody has a cell phone. So uh, you can ask your students maybe to go out and think of you know, their surroundings and they could take pictures or videos. And I use a video platform, Kaltura actually has a wonderful free mobile app. So they could take videos, uh, field recordings and upload it directly to a course. So there's a lot of options here for students to get engaged and to connect. Questions so far? Okay. Sorry, I I'm mixed up my slides. Um, okay, so there are some other activities as well. Um, I think sometimes 
at least this was for me. Uh, when I first started teaching online, I, I felt like I was the one who had to talk the whole period. And that's simply not the case. And in fact, students really respond well to having other types of activities. So these are just some other ideas that you could incorporate. Um, students love guest lecturers, so, so bring in somebody who's an expert in the field. Um, set up an electronic library day with their librarian. Another idea is the Shark Tank, right? Ask your students to come up with a competition um, and then have a, a group or a panel review um, each presentation or submission. Um, this, this can be really um, just transformative for your courses um, when you start doing things of this nature, right? I think the last time I saw this, it was for a marketing course and students were randomly divided into groups and they got to present, um, I think, their best uh, marketing pitch for, for a product. So, um, and then they got uh, reviews from a panel or feedback, I should say. We talked about it briefly before, but ask students to go out into the field um, and record some of their findings. You can also present a series of case studies and ask students to predict the outcome of the next one in the series. Um, this is this is very helpful too. Uh, you know, if you're trying to to get students to recognize patterns, uh, things of that nature. And then include activities that incorporate current events. So again. If you can come up with some type of activity in your course um, that relates to current events that they feel are relevant to them, um, students can, again, really feel that this is different than just a, a lecture hall that's virtual. All right. I think we're doing really well on time. So I have a, a question here for you and you can, again, your choice out, um, type in the chat or turn on your microphone. Um, well, actually it's a two part question. How do you measure and assess student engagement in an online synchronous session? And the second part is how do you provide feedback in your synchronous sessions? I can go first for the first question. Um, the way that I measure uh, my student engagement is oh, Risa, I, th I think we lost you. Hello? Can anyone else hear him? Uh, I can go. Uh, for my classes, online classes like this, I usually or sometimes I ask a specific thing to students and sometimes I, I might pick a student also who should give me the answer. So that way I can measure actually how much they are, they are, they are engaged with the class. So this is one thing. And in terms of feedback, uh, I don't know what you mean, feed, because sometimes students ask things or I give them some time to asking things or they can type on the chat then I can give the answer or so after what they're asking for. So that's that's from my part. Yeah, sometimes verbal feedback is the way to do it. Excellent. OK, Thanks. and Riza, I'm so sorry. I. I don't know if it was just me or if it was everybody, but um, it clicked out when you responded. So I'm sorry if I didn't catch your response. Okay, I do see some responses here. Oh, no problem. It's it's just a, a crazy frozen day. And everybody's having tech problems too. So it's just the start of a new semester. Patty says, I haven't really done class this way. I have had some hybrid classes in the past, and I would just try to ask questions and even call on the ones who, are, who aren't speaking much. Yes. I have even had it with students where I knew they didn't want to speak. Um, so I, I started doing the random name generator. I, I don't know if any of you have seen these websites or not, um, but basically it, it creates um, like a wheel of, 
a fortune and you just type in the the student names and so when you spin the wheel it, it lands on somebody's name and whoever it lands on that that's who you call on um, but you know what it, if students know you're going to use the wheel of fortune um, everybody gets ready to to start talking so uh, no students, we, we cannot allow them to become silent passengers um, in some way, shape or form. If they're coming to a synchronous session, it means that they're there to collaborate and they are there to interact. So um, however you would like to encourage that, um, you can do so. Okay. Great, thank you. So one of the things that I, I've learned about synchronous sessions is oftentimes instructors will take attendance, um, but it's really not just attendance, right? It, even if we say it's for points or you have to come to class, it's not just because physically I want you to log in. Um, the reason that I need you there is because I need you to do something. I need you to demonstrate your critical thinking skills, right? Maybe I'm going to ask you to present. Um, I might ask you to collaborate with your peers, right? So there's a lot more going on than you just showing up. I, I mean, I understand that is the physical act of attendance, but the truth is we, we want something more than, than just for you to log into a synchronous session. Um, so if you're going to take attendance, you might as well do it in a way where you can gather uh, feedback from your students. And so I, I often call them exit slips, but you can call it what you like. Um, I will distribute an exit slip and I'll distribute it at all different times during my course, um, right? So if I have a two hour synchronous session or a two hour and 40 minute synchronous session, I might distribute it early on. Um, I might distribute it at the end of class. And so students never know exactly where it's going to pop up. And, you know, if I'm really worried that my students are not uh, staying the whole time, I can always go back and look at the attendance log. It'll show me who logged in and how long they were there. Um, and so you can pull this for, for any um, web conferencing tool. But what I really want to know from my students is some information. I sometimes think that we get information from our students uh, too late. Sometimes we get their feedback at the end of the course when they submit their course evaluations. So this is an opportunity for me to check on their engagement. And so these are some kind of bullet points of things that you could do, right? You could ask them to summarize today's lesson in one sentence. Um, you could ask them to highlight the main points or the topics that they that they gleaned from the lecture material, right? So not that you can't have lectures, but just to, to use them um, intentionally. You could ask them how does, you know, today's lesson relate to current events? Uh, maybe you want to ask them where they have observed something in a social context, right? So this is where we're asking students to connect their coursework with the outside world. Um, and you could also ask them what could be improved. Uh, this is a great way to get feedback on, you know, parts of the lesson plan where they found something confusing or they thought, hey, that worked really well. I'd like to see more of it. Um, so this is a great way if you're going to take attendance in these synchronous sessions, uh, this is where you can start to, to gain specific insight into their kind of into their uh, minds and, and how they really feel about the lesson plan. Something else that I've done is I've included mandatory office hours. I've played with this in a multitude of contexts. I, I've used this outside of class time. I've even used it during class time. So uh, mandatory office hours, though, is a way for you to, to get to talk to your students. So again, there are different ways to go about this. You might ask them to meet with you and to sign up to meet with you virtually periodically throughout the semester, maybe early on, um, just so that they get to know you and then follow up later on in the semester. Maybe you'll meet with them right before they turn in a large project, right? So then you can give them some of that individualized uh, feedback. 
some instructors struggle with this and they say, well, you know, my, my students really, they're too busy and I can't meet with them outside of class time. I understand that does happen. So um, sometimes I've turned, you know, two, two class periods um, into mandatory office hours and I would break my class up into 15 minute increments and I would ask my students to sign up for a slot. When are you going to drop in? Um, so there are different options here. But one of the nice things to know about this is that um, mandatory office hours actually does help meet that uh, federal regulation for regular and substantive interaction because this is a way for you to meet students one-on-one -on -one and to give them kind of that individual support. So if you had virtual office hours and you just asked students, you, you said, well, I'll be available on Mondays between 3 to 5 p.m. You can stop in. Um, you know, you might not really get to meet many of your students. The majority of them uh, will not attend. So mandating office hours and, and telling your students, I need you to meet with me uh, is a way to help increase that engagement with your course as well. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes left. We've got plenty of time. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the technology itself, because I feel like sometimes when we talk about these strategies, they sound well and good, but if you don't know how to use technology to achieve these kind of activities, uh, then it doesn't really work and you can't implement them. So a couple of things. When it comes to online classes, you may want to record them. There's also some pre-planning involved. Oftentimes, if you just log into a class and hope for the best, um, it might not work as well as you hope. So um, go ahead and test out your platform. If you want to learn more about how to screen share and do breakout rooms or whiteboard activities or whatever you're thinking in your in your virtual session, um, feel free to contact the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. We have one hour consultations. We'll just meet with you one on one and we'll help you set everything up. Um, you know, I can even act as a pretend student and, and I can test out your break rooms for you. So um, by all means, you know, contact us. Let us know if we can help you with this. But um, some other things that you may need to do ahead of time that kind of goes with that pre-planning is creating shareable documents, which I'll show you in uh, just a moment how you can do that. And then um, I had to put this on here because I think this is something that I always forget is if you start out in a main room, kind of like what we're in right now in Blackboard Collaborate, if I were to throw all of you into breakout rooms and then I brought you back to the main room together as a whole class, I'd have to remember to resume recording. Um, it will shut off. Um, so just to be aware, recording does not happen when students are in the breakout rooms um, and usually it disconnects the um, uh, the connection. So particularly if you as an instructor start hopping around and visiting students in their breakout rooms. So I did want to remind you that that's just one of those little pieces you always have to, you have to remember. Sometimes I put a sticky note on my, on my computer to remind myself to <laughs> resume recording. So it's just so many things you have to juggle as a teacher. When it comes to creating shareable documents, you can use uh, Google Docs if you want. Uh, many of us have a Gmail account, so you can do Google Docs. But the other part is uh, we license Office 365 at NIU. So this is already built into your account. So um, what you're seeing here on the screen is a screenshot of the NIU webpage. Just go to niu.edu. And at the top under quick links, you'll see something that says Office 365. So when you do this, um, I think this is where I got some of my, my slides out of order, um, but you'll have an option here to um, just create anything that you want. It, it's going to look just like Microsoft Word. It, it's going to look like a Word document if you had an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so you're going to create kind of a template, right? And you can copy it. You can save it as many times as you want. Um, so usually I'll get one that I really like, and then I'll, I'll try to envision ahead of time, like how many groups might I, might I have in class? And I would think, okay, well, if I'm gonna have eight groups, then I need to save this document eight different times, right? So I'll have 
document one, document two, document three, and then when I put students into their breakout group, then they'll each just open that document that corresponds with their breakout room number. Um, and so to do that, after you've created and saved your documents, you return to your files, you click the three dots, you click share, and um, you can share with anyone. And then if you want students to edit, that's, um, that's where you click the can edit, right? So if you want students to fill out the document, then they're gonna need editing privileges. So that's the difference between giving them a handout versus giving them something that they need to fill out and complete. Additionally, um, you know, I heard somebody mention before, well, I never know if I put them in groups, who's doing what. Um, I like to give them very specific instructions. If any of you were able to attend our Teaching Effectiveness Institute, we had a guest speaker who would throw us into these breakout groups. And before she put us into the breakout groups, uh, she would give specific instructions. So they can be as fun or silly as you like. She could say, whoever has the biggest shoe size has to be the person who records everything on the on the document. And whoever has the smallest shoe size, um, they're going to be the person when we come back together as a main group who shares their, their work. All right, so again, this is kind of the create the shareable documents. Um, so again, I just kind of gave you some specific steps here. Go to niu.edu, quick links, Office 365. Um, you go to OneDrive, My Files, Add New, and that's where you upload a Word document or you create a new one. If you want, I can send that in a follow-up email after this workshop. And we have exactly five minutes left, so we did wonderful on time. I can go ahead and I can stop the recording, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, let me know if there's anything you need me to demonstrate. Otherwise, I can give you five minutes back in your day. <laughs>